Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, it's Pino Trogo again from San Francisco State. It's uh, April 9th, 2020, and this is the introduction to drawing for designers class. And today we're going to do a freehand drawing, so a little bit simpler, a little bit more, um, uh, yeah, free, no tools. Um, so welcome back everyone i'm going to switch to the camera on the desk so this is actually an assignment that um and i did a tape this morning as well it's an assignment that actually i used to have uh, the beginning of the class, but because I wanted to leave more room for the uh, for the perspective drawings, I I had eliminated it. And you're welcome um, to do both this and the uh, two point perspective tutorial that we did on Tuesday. But this is also for those people who may not be able to do that other one, so they can do this as an alternative. Um, even though later when we do more perspective drawing. Uh, you really kind of need the previous one from Tuesday. So either or or both, um, I guess, are the uh, are the options. But very encourage I encourage you to do the, the tutorial for the perspective um, if you're going to do the uh, the other two perspective drawings. Even though I'll have alternative drawings for those as well, uh, so that people get a chance to do something if they have a problem with uh, with tools and setup. Um, so I have a few things to show before we start um, drawing, which we will be drawing a wood block. Now, I know you don't have a wood block, but um, because it's going to be uh, isometric drawing or axonometric drawing, once we do the first sketch, we can just pretend that, that you have a block in front of you and actually this morning, I thought that one way to do that will be to simply draw your um, your letter, which could be your initial, for example. Let me just have to find it. Yeah. So what you could do is uh, draw the letter, and notice how it's flipped because these these are printing blocks, so that actually when you print with them, you would see the letter. Um, the right orientation. Um, what you can do is after you draw it, you could take a block, let's say a box like this, and you could literally just like tape it on top of the block. Then you could put this on your desk and look at it as if it were the real thing. Of course it's not, but it, it could be an approximation. So I'm not sure how many of you are going to go into product design versus graphic design um, people always say product designers don't have enough typography and, and graphic skills and probably true to some extent but so hopefully this will be good for everyone um, okay so let's talk about letterpress so letterpress is the way printing used to happen pretty much at all levels. And in the very old days, going back to Gutenberg, even though the layout might not have been like this, um, in terms of where each letter would sit in this drawer in this case, but the letters themselves were pretty much uh, all like this. Going back, let's see if it focuses. Uh, it doesn't quite focus. Let's see if I move the camera. There we go. So this is a metal uh, block. It's called a, a type, or a, actually it's called a sort. And I just have to get it in focus. And actually the term to be out of sorts means that you run out of letters. Like if I run out of these, all of a sudden I'm out of sorts and I can't finish making my composition because each one of these letters um, this one is 72 point it's actually six picas come on camera focus there you go 
that's six picas high, which means it's 72 point. Um, yeah, somehow this camera goes to sleep. But you can also have very small or rather small type, which is 12 point type. Um, see if I can wake it up. I don't know if you can see it. That's an M and it's a pica. Actually, is it a pica? Yeah, it's a pica. So it means that it's 12 point because there are 12 points in a pica. Um, and this is a, uh, a, a printer's gauge or a pica ruler. So if you're a graphic designer, actually you should have one of these, even though it's very analog. Um, you can tell which side the leather goes because of this thing called a groove, um, sorry, a nick. Um, and so that goes away from the composer, compositor rather. And so this is an M. I mean, you can kind of tell this is an M, but if you had a leather like this, you wouldn't know if that's a six or a nine. And the way, I can, again, you tell is that that's the bottom of the leather. So that's a nine. Um, so these are made of lead and lead, antimony, and tin. And they're all the same height. So that when, I, when they're on the press, they're, they're slightly less than an inch, 9.18, 0.918, I think is the, the height. And you can see you have different type, types, different styles. And the face, type faces used to be two words. This is type, and this is the face of the type. And this is actually the shoulder on this block. So the face of the type, is the part that actually prints. The rest does not print. You would take these letters from the case and you would compose it. You would have to memorize. This is a big case, okay? It's probably like uh, 36 inches wide. And you would pick these letters and put them in what's called a composing stick that you would set the length, the width, the measure. And then you would take these letters and put them in. And then from here, you transfer them to the press. And it's a pretty laborious process. Um, I just wanted to show you this because it's from a friend of mine who passed away a couple of years ago, close to 100 years old. Um, and he set this block of type to show how sometimes some books are made with really, really small type. This is actually six point type. Let's see if I can show it. So in other words, half a pica, uh, yes, half a pica wide. And the size of the type, of course, goes all the way from the top of the letter to the bottom. Um, I have to be careful because if I drop this, it's going to be a disaster. Um, so you set your type, you pick your letters from the case, and you hold the stick like this, and you hold the type with your thumb. Um, and then you have to put all the blanks in between, between the words uh, and also between the lines, which this one doesn't have. But um, you set from left to right, just like you normally write, but then of course it's upside down and you can see how, let's see. If you put a mirror, you can actually kind of proofread it a little bit. Now this is in Italian, so might be a few a little hard but um but that's how you would actually almost try to see if there was any mistake otherwise you have to print it and see if there's mistakes in the printout so that's the composing stick the person who composes it's called the compositor and um and so you could combine in the same project uh, metal letters and wooden leathers. And these are wood because they would be so heavy if they were made out of lead like this one. So, let's see. Uh, yeah, just another little, I don't know if you recall, I showed you a couple of Valentines I'd made over the years. This was another one where I just um, glued together a bunch of wooden leathers. Of course, they're weird, right? Because they're, they're left to right, but I couldn't, 
set them left to right. I had to do them. Um, I mean, I did set them left to right, but they're flipped, so it's a little bit odd. Um, and I just collaged it into one big block. Sometimes the camera decides to focus, sometimes it doesn't. Oh, that's pretty good. Um, okay, so just, yeah, just real few things about typography. Um, I'll just show you a few books real quick. Uh, this is a small little booklet. It's called Detail in Typography by Yost Okuli. Um, and it's all about small details in typography. But it also talks about things like the shapes of letters and how they're sometimes deformed in order for them to appear actually correct. I'll go over some of these um, optical corrections. But there is one thing I wanted to show you. Um, so with leather press, um, you have physical blocks, right? So there's no way that you can, for example, make the leathers closer than they can be, right? Because it's just impossible. Um, with the computer, of course, they can go in and out, right? And they could overlap. Um, however, uh, there we go. Okay, so these lines which you don't see in the computer are actually there in the setup of the typeface. So whoever designs a typeface has to decide how much room am I going to put next to the letter so that the next letter is, you know, at a certain distance? Um, it's this spacing. It's called the side bearings. So this architecture is there. It's just that you don't see it. Um, so these are called ascenders. These are called descenders. And this is the X I because the X letter, the lowercase X, gives the uh, the uh well what's called the x height so depending some letters have a very small x height so they look smaller even though they're the same type size and the type size of course is the entire thing also called body height let's see maybe i'm lucky on my body here well what do you say it's exactly 72 points right now that particular letter on the drawing um a very quick thing about upper and lower case is that the the California job cage, which which by the way is the one that we have in the shop, in the leather press shop, where both the uppercase letters and the lowercase letter are on the same drawer, on the same case. It's called the case, okay, not a drawer. Um, in the old days though, it was actually there used to be in fact an uppercase with all the caps and a lowercase with the lower caps, okay? So the compositor would be taking letters from either the uppercase or from the lowercase. And that's where the name came from, uppercase and lowercase, or big letters, small letters. Um, I'll just quickly show you um, a couple of books that we made in my in the letterpress class when I was teaching it a couple a year ago. So we called it stanza one fifty three, which stanza is like in a poem, you know, a chunk of po of a poem, but it also means room in Italian. Um, and so we made um, books with uh, samples of the typefaces that are there, and these are all kinds of rulers. So everything here that you'll see is printed using uh, metal type. And so each student had to set a quote and then with the particular typeface that they were, um, that they selected from the, from the shop, okay? So this is 36 point Gaudi Dipton, which is an old style face for text, for reading. And um, here's an example where the X height, let's see if it focuses. 
Yeah. Ah, how about that. So you can see in this in this type phase, the excite is really, really tiny. So the ascender and the descender are very long. So what that means is that perhaps this is 12 point, but it looks a lot smaller than 12 point because of that. Um, there is a lot of space in between each line. And each student in this particular project um, also could do a separate page, kind of more decorative page. Perhaps it was their initials. Um, you can print with silver ink on black paper. did also a second book a semester later and it's pretty much the same idea um, but at the end I want to show you that's also six point type by the way really tiny but very sharp the thing about letterpress is that it really is truly the best um, the best type of printing except it takes too much work and too much time and too much resources um, but it can be very very good and then at the end we we made a page that um, was fun because we printed our names um, and then we we did a trick we we brought all the spacing materials up so let me just show you Again, if you look at this block of type, all the little gaps, those are the lower, the letters that are a little bit further in, which don't touch the paper, which don't print. Um, so that's called the spacing material. Um, and in this particular print, we were able to actually bring it to the same level. Uh, and then we flipped it and we did this, which is actually the same as this but it, because it's the other side, it's only the bottom of the letters. Um, the bottom of the letters have a thing called a groove because they're cast into a mold, hot met metal mold. Uh, the hot metal goes into the mold and then when they're disconnected from the mold, they're broken off from this part. And this is what you see here, these gaps. So it looks like two letters, but each one of these is actually one letter. Okay. So, um, another little historical thing is that caps, uppercase letter in the Roman alphabet basically derive from Roman letters, literally. And those are the letters that used to be carved in stone in Roman inscriptions. Um, and this book shows how that was used also in the old public library in San Francisco, which is now the um, Asian Art Museum. And it says now Asian Art Museum at the top. However, the old inscription actually was kept. Let me see if I can find it. Um, and so someday when somebody's going to take that thing down underneath, they're going to see that there is actually the old, the public library of the city and county of San Francisco. Um, yeah, it's a nice carving. May this structure throned on imperishable books be maintained and cherished from generation to generation for the improvement and the light of mankind. Pretty strong. Um, okay, so these are some of the inscriptions. I think they're still there. Some of them I think might have been covered up, um, all carved by hand. This is just a giant rubbing of one of the inscriptions. So caps come from Roman letters. Um, but lower 
case letters, the ones we normally read in books, um, come from handwriting. Let's see if I find. So before the invention of you know movable type and printing, of course every book had to be copied from one to the next by monks or by other uh, people who had the good a good handwriting. When printing was invented in fourteen, let's say fifty five, I think, um, meaning with movable type, uh, the trick was to actually replicate what looked like being done by hand. So eventually some of the best type designs really became based on um, the, most, the most successful handwriting. And those happen to be actually from Italy, right? So lowercase letters are pretty much derived from, um, from the way you would write. And the way you would write was often with a flat tool. Okay, something like that, perhaps, you know, cut out maybe from a, from a piece of bamboo. Okay, the ink would be there, or maybe a, a, um, a quill, right? Now, depending on how you, if you hold that, if you keep it all at the same angle, like let's pretend this is, a, and this is basically calligraphy, because of that direction, right? If, if I keep, if I don't move the angle of my um, tool, you get this idea of thick and thin, right? And that's how some of the more classical, or I should say all style, typefaces um, are basically based on, okay? Um, the other thing you should remember about um, lowercase is that you should not space um, lowercase letters. You should, whereas for example, uppercase letters, you kind of do want to space because otherwise they're too blocky and too much looking the same. Lowercase letters should be left alone. They shouldn't be moved too much apart because when you write, um, you are in fact writing one letter after another, right? Yeah, the first step when you do your letter is to, to just decide what letter it is, of course, and then figure out the proportions, right? So this morning I was doing this letter and I figured out that the width was about two thirds of the height, meaning, yeah, like I figured, okay, if that's my half, that's two units and then that's three units or put another way, if that's my width, I can see that, you know, it's about one and a half times. So you would draw your letter first you know, as a separate as a separate piece of paper. And you can combine this drawing with the drawing of the letter itself in oblique later uh, in the same page, but it doesn't have to be, okay. It can be on separate pages. I'm putting, uh, I'm letting people upload more than one file um, to iLearn. So, you know, if you have two pages, that's fine. Um, and ideally you would want some letter that maybe has uh, both some curves and some straight lines. Um, and if it's just straight lines, maybe you can round off what are called serifs. So some typefaces um, don't have any like little embellishments at the end of the strokes, but some do. So for example, Garamond or maybe Bodoni, um, might have these little guys right here, right? These little parts, they're called serifs. Um, so a sans, which means without in French, sans serif font means like Helvetica, which does not have these little embellishments, 
okay? And then there's different types of serves. Um, there are some that are more tapered like that. Maybe that's times. Maybe there's like some that are like that. That's kind of Garamond maybe. Um, and then you have what's, what are called slab serves. Very blocky. Sometimes you have a combination of that. Stuff. Um, and so like in this, in this thing that I made uh, for my wife some years ago, this is uh, what's called, yeah, it's a square serif, but it's also rounded a little bit. The serifs have a little connecting round shape. Come on. Uh, here we go. Okay. So, you know, maybe you can invent a typeface. I mean, it doesn't have to be an original um, typeface. Um, the thing to remember, though, is that, um, well, there's many, many, I mean, you know, one, one can do a whole semester just on leather forms and designing typefaces. But this is a pretty big distinction. It's either sans serif, like Helvetica, or serif, like Garamond, perhaps Times, um, and then other typefaces. So in our letter, I'll show, I'll show one that has a little bit of both, okay? Um, And then watch out in the letters, even though, actually even a typeface like this one, which is very geometric, very like um, regular in terms of its geometry. Come on, gets confused, okay. Even this typeface, if you look really, really close, you will see that some t the, the strokes are not all the same because like when they get connected here, you know, when one stroke connects to another, it, it, it would create a big area that's very fat. And so there's quite a few uh, corrections. Uh, another one is that the horizontal strokes are, are thinner than the vertical strokes. Let me just draw that because this camera just doesn't want to, doesn't like being so close. Um, Uh, just a second. I guess an E is a good an E is a good letter to to show it. So an E, for example, you might start with the basic geometry, right? Like that, let's say. Um, and then you might create the strokes, right? And what happens with that process is that even though you make everything the same, um, the strokes are gonna look different. Like the horizontal stroke is gonna look fat. So in order to make it look like the vertical stroke, we need, we need to shave it off a little bit. So all the horizontal strokes. Um, the middle one, even more so, and also it needs to be pushed up because if I do this exactly in half, it's gonna look a little bit down. So I need to make it higher to make it look right. Um, then the other thing is that these parts are gonna look like they're gonna fall off. So we need to shave off some of those endings and the middle one even more so. So that the end result is, yeah, what you would call an optically corrected letter that appears to be uniform. Okay, and now this is exaggerated, but it is in fact quite different in all its parts. Um, uh, this often applies to also your round letters. So, so an S, for example, is actually um, typically, let me catch the light here, smaller at the top. So this letter, I know this is the right side up. Now, if I flip it the other way, it's actually much heavier on the top. Um, and I know this is the top because there is a gap there. And right there, there you go. You see that, that little space there? 
So in a in a drawn F, and now this is this is drawn the right side, left to right. Um, those spacing would be that spacing would be here. Okay, there would be a little gap there, and this whole part is like smaller than this part. Uh, this layer also is again adapted from something that might be maybe like a general construction, which we might think of as an S. But if you just simply do it like that, some parts are going to look sagging and kind of weird. And also you cannot keep the same thickness going through the same because it would create weird shapes. So what happens is maybe there is a, a different axis that gets created. And then this idea again that the top part, the horizontal parts, this is like a horizontal part, get made a little thinner. Um, and these serifs here also are a little smaller. This part is smaller than that part. Although it didn't quite come out that way. So even a basic shape like this is actually quite complex and requires a lot of curves, which unfortunately are not simple circles because it's just not that easy. Although some typefaces are very geometric and very like architectural, uh, the best typefaces are actually the ones where the letters are not so even looking. Um, your eye, especially when reading, actually prefers that the shapes not be um, the same. Like, the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you don't notice it, but okay, let's pick this one. You don't notice it, but actually the letter forms are constantly moving, right? See how it's thin, then it's thick, then it's thin, thick, thin, you know, even, even the axis of these letters is a little bit angled. It's called the stress, in this case, the L. If you look, the thin part is not perfectly on top and the bottom thin part is not perfectly at the bottom. Um, so variation is actually very good so that the eye doesn't get tired. Um, so what I just showed would be if I do an O, maybe that's too big. It's actually not easy. So that's my, that might be an O as it appears in my, in my typeface, right? And maybe there is a P or a Q rather. Um, so you can see how this is like thin and thin. So actually that gives us an angle that's not exactly the vertical. And so sometimes faces are slightly, you know, angled a different way in that. But the variation, which I actually didn't do very much here, is very, very important. Um, unfortunately, this, this nib is too thick already. Um, okay, Let's see what else. Um, there are other issues with uh, printing that, um, well, also other optical things. Like if I, if I have a letter that I has, um, let's see. When you have a little pointy like that, it might stick out of its sort of normal line. So for example, if there is a T here, which might fit in that line, these, th these parts might actually stick out. Um, and so will something like an O. So an O, if it was exactly this there, it would actually be, it would look smaller. So an O actually sticks out a little bit at the bottom and a little bit at the top. 
then the last thing I'm going to talk about correction is that ink will tend to round, to make things look round when it prints. If there is a tight spot like that, the ink will kind of bleed and will make it, you know, a little too uh, filled in. So in order to correct for that, um, sometimes typefaces are designed like this, which you don't necessarily see. It creates a little trap for the extra ink to fill in. Um, all details that probably you are not going to see in wood type because they're so big, but you definitely would see it in, in small um, in small letters. Okay, so let's let's draw let's draw one of these letters. So this morning I drew I drew a P, just my name. Um, Started out again by drawing first the letter itself. Oh, here we go. Yeah. So draw it if it happens to be a letter that has a left and a right side. Do it, you know, the opposite way. I mean, do it the way a wood block would be, right? So in this case, the P is looking the other way. Um, And if it's an A, um, which normally would be maybe like this, which looks about right, you would draw it, you know, the other way, which doesn't look as familiar, right? It looks a little odd, uh, but that's the way the wood block would be. So draw your letter first based on the proportions that you think. I guess you could just copy it from whatever you might print out or enlarge on your computer. And once you have that, um, then you build, you know, you build it. And that's why I was saying if you, if you had a block and you put it on your block and you kind of taped it onto your block, then you could orient it as if you had the real thing, right? Remember? Um, somebody asked about perspective. We, you don't need to worry about perspective unless you want to uh, fool around with it. And at the very end this morning, I did one example in which the shape was kind of in perspective. So that these parts are smaller than these parts and these are smaller than these parts. But it's up to you. It's not required or it makes it a little harder. But um, And I would start still with, you know, 30, 30 degrees, which is, you know, the one we've been using all along uh, because it makes things a little easier uh, in terms of referencing the sides of your plan view, which would, would be this one, and then transferring those, that information on these edges, which is known onto the edges of your block, okay? Um, once you draw it, once you've created this, then in order to show the depth, to show how this comes up, uh, tracing paper is a great thing because you can, now in a, in a second, I'm gonna do a brand new one, okay? But just, because what you can do is, you can trace your shape. Oh, where is it there? Actually, I have to, I have to do it fresh, otherwise it doesn't. Um, the one part that's hard to draw to see exactly how things end is actually this corner right there inside, right? And that is because our eye will tend to see these lines actually more rounded than they really are and not disappearing correctly underneath. So to figure out exactly how it disappears behind there or underneath below, um, if, you tra if you use tracing paper, you can then trace your letter that you have drawn. 
and simply move it up and down um, so that I can get exactly the same shape kind of left behind below, you know, at the level of the, what we were calling again, the shoulder, right? So then, see, then it's actually not so hard to, to see what the, did I do this right? I didn't quite trace it right there, but you can see there, Typically, if I didn't if I didn't have these, probably what my eye would want to do is that, which as you can see, it wouldn't be right. In fact, this is correct because it disappears as a kind of a straight line underneath. So that's the step to get the uh, to get the depth, and then you can finish the other parts. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and do one now. Does anybody have any question? Uh, bye, Justin. I guess you had to leave. Um, let's see. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to do a different letter. Um, if you have Again, the trick is to take whatever the outer uh, points of references are to um, to transfer those onto your oblique view, right? So let's say if this is a square, that's your square in oblique view. Uh, whatever details you have on the edges, you just transfer them onto your edges and then you connect all those lines because what happens there is a little trickier than what happens on the side. Let's see, yeah, all right. So maybe I'll do, uh, maybe I'll do a T, I'll just invent a T um, that has some curves. Now, if you have a letter that's totally curvy, like say an S, um, yeah, of course, first try to draw it, right? On your, on the side. And again, remember, okay, come on. Remember it's, um, that it theoretically is made up of two circles, right? But then it gets a little more complicated. So in this case, what I what I need to remember is I know I know that there is an axis here that kind of goes like that, and that's going to guide me a little bit. Okay. Um, and maybe I have like two circles for the top and the bottom. Right, so it's not um, approximating everything to be circles is actually not a bad, not a bad thing. Um, even though, like I said, there's probably not a single, not a single simple circle here. Um, And now my S is a little bit long, right? It's a little bit, it's actually here needs to curve out. So don't be afraid to just, you know, make a mess. It's okay. <laughs> Nobody's watching except for you. <laughs> um, it's not quite right. My leather again is, but that's because I think I got my original proportions wrong, right? I, sh I should have made it a little more, more, squarish and I didn't so it's a little late now I should do another another drawing but let's assume it's correct so then if you wanted to transfer that um, it's a little bit tricky but these things will help you like let's say determining that axis so for maybe from here to here right from there to here from there to here um, can help you 
And then everything else, maybe you treat like ellipses. So you know there is an ellipse down here, you know there is an ellipse up there, and you know there is some kind of larger. So you see, doing a bunch of ellipses kind of all the time can help. Uh, of course, ellipses, because those are supposedly your, your, um, your circles, right? And even though we know they're not circles, we can we just have to make some decisions. So sorry, you're not seeing the actual letter here. Um, but I don't have to look. I can I can just be looking at that, right? That's the idea. Um, okay. Um, does have any questions? I'm just gonna make sure I see. Okay. So I'm gonna do a T. How about that for Trogo? Since I did a, a P this morning. Um, And the clean sheet. Yeah, so I'll do I'll do a T that has um, similar to that Valentine thing. I don't know if there is a T, capital T, there isn't, but um, so it's a T that has um, fairly large, let's see. No, I'm not liking it. <laughs> Drawing typefaces is really hard, by the way. No, I'm not happy with that. I think I'll, uh, I think I'll pick something else. Um, I'll pick the L for Lizzie, my wife. Okay, I'll just do an L. Almost looks like a J, right? But that's actually is an L. I mean, it's a, uh, yeah, it's an L. So, sorry, Let's try it again. So it's a little simpler. Got a big, so if it was straight, if it were printed, it would be like this, right? Roughly. Yes. Uh, so, what we can say is that perhaps this L is made with like circles that are here. So we have these quarter circles. A big circle that's maybe here. I'm not going to simplify it. And then another circle that's here. And it's about, again, it's maybe three to two, the proportions, right? Um, just for ease of figuring out the proportions. Okay. I'm going to do it now on the same in the same sheet. So that, there's a lot of information here that's pretty straightforward in terms of spacing. Maybe I want to darken it so I can really see it. Um, I'm using these really soft pencils, which are actually quite nice. Uh, if you want to get away for a moment from the kind of strict hardness of the um, of the um, 2H lead from the mechanical pencil, right? Um, so 
Yeah, and drawing it big might be a good thing because with another sheet, so a little more white underneath. Okay. Um, yeah, so I tried to hit my angle again of 30, 30, because that makes it simpler. Um, and we said it's one and a half. So if I draw a vertical, then I get the square. So that's about right, see, about three parts. Um, and you can help by help yourself by moving your paper sideways to make it easier. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so now I know that I've already a lot of locations that I can sort of use, like I made it really simple. So my center here is the left edge of my vertical stroke is about two thirds, so I can I can split that distance, two thirds of that, and maybe I can get my main stroke, which really is the main element of this letter, right? Um, then perhaps my horizontal strokes. There are hardly any strokes horizontally, but that technically is a stroke right here. So that's thinner, right? So maybe maybe like that right there, right? Uh, and I do the same at the top because they're the same, even though at the top, there's really no stroke, it's just the, uh, just the serif endings. Um, I think now the next thing is this part and how this circle defines this entire connecting part here. Uh, so that's, again, one, two, three thirds. All right. So we can uh, we can we can try to locate this circle. It's right here. And remember to to draw um, a circle at an angle. We do ellipses, right? And we do that. So here I'm going to try to construct a circle, a square rather that will fit my, my circle. In other words, this square, which would be this one. Right. And then we, we just try to hit, remember to do dry runs. So like before you actually commit, you know, just get your, so the muscle memory going so that when you when you finally touch the paper you have a good sense of where of where you might be ending up and then we just use the part that we really need um, so it's almost done except for the now these are the three little guys which are basically that's a quarter of it all right, so again, I, what I do now is I construct in each one of these um, my um, inscribing squares, you know, roughly. Actually, no, sorry, that's here, wrong spot. Whenever I do these circles, I end up using only a quarter of them. So right here, I'm gonna be using this, this part, which is that part. Whereas right here, I'm gonna be using this part. I'm gonna be essentially saying, they're the same quarter, but much different view, right? Because to the sides it gets squished and at the top it gets expanded. Um, Mm 
I'm the same thing here. And then after I'm done with all these things, then, then I, now I can connect and maybe I turn the paper around so that I, I make it easier. And if I start from the curve in, then I get a better chance of connecting it properly um, because it's hard to, again, end on a dime, right? And maybe my serves are a little bit thick there, so maybe I just... Where are we? Yes. Then I, I can go back in and make it a little more Define in the corners. So that's that's the process. This particular font it actually is actually pretty good for this exercise because it, it's fairly straightforward. You know, it's either circles or straight lines. Um, so once you have done that, you just you use tracing paper again to figure out this process. So if I have do a big one here. Um, let's say I have a counter. By the way, the negative parts of letters, they're called counters. Um, So let's say I have a letter that looks like that. If I want to see again how it's going to drop down, um, the way to do it is to move up like that so that I can instantly see what's left underneath. Okay. So here, I'm going to do exactly that. But first, I'm going to sharpen my pencil because it's getting a little too thick. Just give me a second. And we're almost done. This can be a short, a short meeting. Um, there is actually, like I said, already a video on um, YouTube as well. I realized the quality of the recordings, they're not actually high definition, they're like almost half. So I'm, I'm, I'm taping this to my computer in the hopes that perhaps it's, um, it's a little better. And if it is, I'll post, I'll post that version um, instead of the one from Zoom, um, the one that Zoom records to its server. So once, yeah, so once I have that, um, um, again, the round, the round shapes are better done first because um, it's easier to then connect two round shapes together with a straight line than to do the opposite, which is um, draw a straight line and then connect the curve to it. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so I've done all my curves. Now I can use around. Um, yeah, so now we use this technique of basically extruding up. I mean, you could extrude down. The problem with that is that uh, there would be an overlap of lines that actually you don't want to see, right, eventually. So... So you just move these up by the same amount, right? 
um, the logic being that if I were to like draw a stick, like from each point here, eventually, yeah, I would be following exactly that line underneath. So, so the tracing paper gives me this really nice um, indication of where I need to be. Um, And just a warning that if you happen to do perhaps a letter like a Z, um, you know, when you do that process, you might see very little of the edge and sometimes not at all. So like if I draw a Z like right here, and now I extrude that up, even by extruding quite a bit, let's say this much, um, because of the angle, is actually quite, it's going to be quite tight here, right? But that's correct because that's that's what you see, and and eventually you wouldn't see um, you wouldn't see anything. Everything would disappear. Sorry, I can't show that here. So whatever whatever that tracing paper and extrusion gives you, that's that's what it is. You you just have to take it. Um, so notice how by extruding it now the bottom, that is the shoulder of my leather, right? It's gonna look just like um, how, that, how that element there, you see how it hits the edge right there. Um, the same thing happens here, but actually on the opposite side if I, right? Right there. And then you can, you know, add your your block. Okay, now that's that's pretty simple. Now if you wanted you could I mean simple looking. If you wanted you could add a little bit of shading, but shading we have talked about this and there is also an eyeliner an example. For the purposes of this class and also in design, you generally don't shade like that. You just do maybe strokes and you space them more if you want to show a fading away. Um, so if I wanted to add a little bit to this drawing, I might do just very little and kind of leave the rest alone because um, you don't want to make it too heavy. Let's see, I guess there, there could be a little bit there too. If I had a cube, even though each face of the cube might look exactly the same value, like meaning very solid, uh, you still don't want to do that to fill it out too much. You would just fade it out like that. And maybe the others would be slightly, slightly less. Um, and then another thing, and the last thing you could do is you could take fade edge and after the fact, touch it up, not touch it up, but like embellish it a little bit with this idea of perhaps crossing your lines and making your lines a little bit more organic, except with a straight edge. So that would look like something like this, which again, it's, a, it's more of a rapid visualization technique. Um, now it's like, now I get a chance to also fix my lines because some of them are not quite in the right spot. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm changing the thickness and I'm like, fading it out, making it dark, you see that? Um, makes the drawing eh, more interesting, more like fresh. This is not required, but it's, it's a nice, for example, that little detail may not be 
you know, too good, right? So by doing this, you kind of go back in and say, hey, let me let me straighten you out. Um, don't overdo it because then then it becomes yet another layer that's all the same, right? So here I'm going to touch up my curves a little bit, emphasize those corners a little bit. Just just some, not not too much, okay. And then again, just finish it up a little bit. So it creates this like double layer of, um, you could call it organic and geometric. So in other words, some lines that look like they were done, you know, what, without worrying too much and some lines that are more precise and more uh, professional or something like that, I don't know. So it looks like Somebody actually spent some time on this drawing, you know what I mean? Um, okay, I think we're there. This is a little funny, right? It looks like it's almost going at an angle. So I don't know how that would have been like that, maybe. Although if design were like that, it could have been, right? Right, this looks almost like the design is like this, but not crazy. So I'll actually, I'll actually fix it um, by doing a little bit of a, a little bit of surgery real quick right there. I masked my drawing a little bit so I could I could um, preserve the rest. Not too thick. So it's a little, there we go. That looks better. Okay. Um, you know. Some parts are a little odd. It's a little odd that this connection here is so abrupt. Um, perhaps it should also have been round, or perhaps it should have been just a little more. A little more. And this, of course, is a typeface design issue. It's not a, a drawing issue, but if, yeah, I think that looks a little better. 